So, uh, hello everyone. I welcome to our distinguished panel. Today we will talk about climate change, asset prices and institutional investors. And uh, I think this is a very important topic because also the financial sector has to play an important role. And according to the Paris Agreement, um, the financial sector has the task to channel the financial flows into sustainable channels. So, therefore, I'm very excited to get a little insight of two distinguished panelists, which I introduce a little bit later. Before we start with um, our panel today, let me take the opportunity to thank especially Banca d'Italia and Bank of England, not just for hosting this conference, but also for putting climate change and the impact on the economy on the top of the agenda of the G20 and G7. This is something I think um, other countries can learn from. So thank you very much to um, those two countries. So let us now uh, start with introducing our distinguished panelists. And we do have from Yale, Stefano Giglio. Um, Stefano, can we see him? Hello. I can hear him, but not see him. Okay, Stefano is a professor at Yale School of Management. And let me also introduce you to Zaharias, Zaharias Sautner, who is next to me here in Milan. Zaharias is a professor at the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. So let's start uh, without further ado with our first presentation. We'll start with Stefano today. And Stefano has published a lot of work about climate and asset pricing. Um, Today, he will not only present us one paper of his work, but we have the honor to listen to his key insights of all his, of his work. And Stefano, I think as far as I understood, you call your research climate finance, what I found very interesting. And your research aims to address, I think, three key points. First, how climate-related risks are priced. Second, how they affect investment decisions, especially those from uh, not only institution but also retail sector. And third, you want to explore the awareness of the investors. So, Stefano, we are very curious to learn from your insights. Thank you. The floor is yours. All right. So, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I wish I was there in Milano also, but I'm not. And uh, let me one second share my slides. Okay. So thank you very much for the for a nice uh, introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak here. Um, so yes, today, as Sabine was mentioning, I, I will talk about uh, several of the papers I've been working on uh, on this topic of interaction of climate change and, uh, and finance, in particular asset prices. Now, the, the kind of broad motivation uh, for this work is that, you know, financial markets, I think, play an important role in addressing climate issues, and they play an important role in thinking about the transition to a sustainable economy. And <clears throat> among these three roles, I would like to highlight three. The first is an informational role, right? We know the financial markets are, you know, they have an important role in general of aggregating information. And, um, and this information, I think, is particularly useful uh, when thinking about climate risks, because it can provide important inputs for economic and policy decisions, which are important in guiding the, the transition to a, a more sustainable economy. So that's one role. The second role is, of course, is that, you know, through financial markets past the funds that are invested. And so, you know, if we are to kind of start investing more in, in cleaner technologies or in cleaner energy sources away from polluting technologies, you know, these allocation of funds will go through the financial system. And so all the actors that play in the financial system Will, you know, will play a role in figuring out exactly how to transfer funds properly. And three, I think there's an important role uh, of financial markets in thinking about how do we manage and share climate risks. So that's kind of the starting point. Now, in all these roles, pr uh, prices actually uh, are quite central. 
right price at the center because they incorporate the information, because you know people respond to the price when they make their investment decisions, and then important to drive the risk chain. Okay, so in this talk, I'm gonna focus on prices and I'm gonna focus on two specific questions. Uh, first, I'm gonna ask how are climate risk reflecting asset prices? So, in other words, do financial markets as of today reflect the your kind of the risk exposure, the exposure to climate risks? Um, um, you know, through the prices, okay? And the second is, uh, what kind of information can we learn from asset prices that is useful to think about managing uh, climate change? So that's the broad outline of the, of, the, of the talk. Let me now start with the first of the two topics, you know, how are uh, climate risks reflected in asset prices? So I think that's a very important question. We, I think it's very important to understand, you know, to what extent uh, markets are pricing in climate risks. That's a very difficult, uh, you know, I, I guess like everything in this space, uh, it's a particularly difficult um, goal uh, for several reasons. Here's what I think are the main challenges. First of all, you heard before already in the previous talk, you know, it's not even very clear what do we even mean by climate risk exactly, which type of climate risk do we think matters for, uh, for prices, do we, uh, how do we measure it? You know, do we care about physical risk? Do we care about transition risk? Do we care about both equally? Or in different proportions. So already, you know, as you've seen before, climate risk is actually a very kind of general term that includes all sorts of effects uh, on the uh, on the economy. And so um, I think you know, there's a first of all a measurement issue in how do we even define and think about uh, empirically about uh, climate different types of climate risks. So that's one um, kind of challenge. The second challenge is that even once we've defined a good measure of climate risk, we need to understand, you know. How do we um, how do we measure individual firm or individual houses or you know assets exposures to climate to climate risk to see whether this climate risk is actually uh, reflecting the price you know in other words more generally how do we measure basically betas with respect to climate risks uh, in the cross section of, of, of companies and and third um, there's an identification problem which is that you know how do we tease out whether what we see in the price data is actually due to the climate exposure or is due to confounders. I'm going to give you an example with, with houses. You know, some houses are more, more, more exposed to climate risk, but they also differ in many other dimensions. And so how do we properly identify uh, the price effects of this, of this climate exposure? Okay, so there's been a lot of new work on this uh, in, the, in the recent literature, in the last decade. Um, and especially one, one of the reasons, you know, Sabine was mentioning climate finance as opposed to climate economics. If you go back to the original models of Nordhaus, you know, these models did not incorporate risk. First of all, the first very first model was deterministic, but even going forward, you know, they, for a while they didn't incorporate risk very seriously. And what I think makes climate finance special is that we're kind of bringing all the tools of finance and asset pricing, and especially thinking serious about risk in terms of, you know, not just quantification of risk, but also the way that people perceive the risk, which again is important because as we try to plan a transition to a, a, you know, a, an economy which is structured different to deal with climate change, we need to think about all the risk and how people perceive this risk. And I think finance can give us uh, specific tools to think systematically about, about those questions. Okay, so there's been a lot of, of progress in, this re in, in the last uh, decades. So what I'm gonna do today, I'm gonna present you some of my research that uh, speaks to, this, to these questions. So uh, first of all, you know, let's go back to the first challenge, which is, you know, what is the relevant climate risk? Well, it turns out that, you know, different asset classes are actually exposed to different aspects of climate risk, for example. And it is not, you know, things are actually not black and white, there's kind of a, a gray area. But for example, you, when you think about real estate, what, what's really special about real estate is that it's not easily movable. Right? I cannot transfer my, my, you know, my land from the beach to the inside. And so there's a kind of a natural exposure to climate change, but to a specific form of climate change specifically, for example, to sea level rise, okay? Uh, or if you live in the middle of the forest uh, in, in, in California, you're probably exposed to, to wildfires. So, there is, there is, for real estate, it's clear that a first order question are uh, physical risks, though there are also regulatory risks that are involved with, you know, with, with housing construction. Um, when you think of equities, you know, the stock market, well, there it seems like at least for, you know, for some industries, there is very clear, or the, the, the most immediate exposure is actually to regulatory risk. For example, if you are a company or in an industry where there's a lot of emissions, where they are probably a prime target for taxation and, and, and other regulatory measures. And so, you know, and, and so that's an industry where the kind of risk you really want to think about is regulatory risk. Uh, 
There's other examples being studied in the literature. Uh, for example, municipal bonds are affected by physical risk. Why? Because the location of the tax base uh, is directly affected by, uh, by the exposure to, to climate uh, change, physical climate change. And then when you think about sovereign debt, you know, there's a, there's a variety of exposures. You know, you could be a country like Bangladesh, which is kind of very directly exposed to, to physical risk. Or you can be an oil producing country, which is obviously much very directly concerned about oil, oil climate. So, uh, I think that the, the literature has, has kind of started understanding better what are the different risks that that um, they matter for different asset classes. But this is certainly work in progress. You know, as the economy changes, we learn more about climate change. We're gonna be we're gonna learn how to uh, what are exactly the right the right measures of, of risk. So then the second biggest the second like fundamental question in addition to you know what we how do we define climate risk exposures is how do we identify. Uh, whether, you know, how do we identify the link between risk exposures and price effects? Now, there are two really, there are two big issues. One is really we have not much data because you can really see a link between risk exposure and prices to the extent that investors are aware of, of, of this climate risk and, and, the, and, uh, and the price it in, and they take into account when they make the investment decisions. Uh, it's very clear that for a long time, you know, there's been nothing about climate risk that was basically uh, reflected in, in asset markets. And so, you know, you, you really can use much of historical data uh, to study this question. And so that's one of the, of, of, of the current constraints in understanding this. Um, and second, and, you know, that's very important for identification purposes is that exposures to climate risk are actually uh, often correlated with other potentially unobservable characteristics. The classic example is housing on the beach. You think, of, you know, uh, and I'm going to go into this more because I have a paper on this, but you know, you think of housing on the beach, you think, well, you know, obviously those that are closer to the beach are more exposed to climate, uh, to, to sea level rise and floods. But of course, they also have better views, they have access to the, to the sea and so on. So they're also more valuable because of these other reasons. So when you look at the price of a house on the beach, well, that's incorporating all these different elements and teasing them out is actually quite difficult. Okay. And so when I said before that, you know, finance can offer a lot of, 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 of tools for this, well, we have decades of work in finance exactly tr trying to figure out this kind of tools that are useful for this kind of identification strategies, both in asset pricing and in corporate finance in different ways. And I'm going to talk about both. And we can take these tools and try to apply them to, um, to understanding the pricing effects of climate risk. So here's an example for one of my, from one of my papers um, uh, with my co-authors, Majori, Ralph Strobel, and Webb. So what did we do? We said, okay, we want to understand whether uh, you know, exposure to sea level rise is price in the housing market. Okay, so what do we do? We explore empirically four states on the on the east coast of the U.S., uh, among which Florida, from which this this map that you see here is taken from. This is downtown Miami, and basically we want to see. Okay, basically at, at kind of very naive level, we want to understand whether houses that are exposed to climate risk are priced different than houses that are not exposed to climate risk. Okay, so what do we do? We take the, the mapping of all these uh, house transactions that happen uh, in, in our data, and uh, and we 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 cross uh, we we, uh, we merge this data set with uh, maps from NOAA on the, ex the you know which properties will be affected by sea uh, feet, uh, sea level rise, which is one of the the, the bad scenarios of, of sea level rise, and um, and you see here you see basically those red house the, the dots in red are transactional houses which are actually affected by, uh, you know, affected by potential sea level rise and those in green are those that are not affected. Now you can see that, of course, that's not exactly the same as being, you know, as distance to the beach because there are other obstacles in the middle, you know, highways and stuff like that that can actually protect some of the areas and there's elevation changes as well. But you can see that whether you're a red uh, dot or not is actually very correlated with whether you're on the beach or not. And of course, a, a kind of a levels comparison between the prices of the red house and the price of the green house, uh, you know, obviously it cannot be interpreted as simply reflecting difference in exposure to climate risk. In fact, you probably would expect, given this picture, the red houses are actually should be more expensive than the green houses. Not because people enjoy being exposed to floods, but because they're on, they're on the beach. Okay, so it's obvious that we cannot kind of directly compare price levels across these two types of houses. So then how can we learn? about whether climate risk is priced in, us, in, in the housing market. Well, we need to figure out some identification strategy. Here's what we came up with. So we look at, first of all, we look at the listings in all these, these, uh, these regions. We, we look at the listings of housing that are put on the market. And we do some textual analysis to figure out uh, 
which house in, in which areas investors seem aware of climate change. So in a sense, we're trying to measure in real time the perception of climate risk of people that participate in the housing market. So here's an example of a, of a, of a listing in Florida. It's a dam in the rough on the water, okay? The owner holds a letter of exemption from FEMA, uh, which is the, you know, basically the regulator in the US that, that deals with, uh, with, with, with floods, uh, stating high elevation, flood insurance may not be required, okay? So this is an example of a listing that directly talks about exposure to, uh, to, climate, uh, to climate risk. And what do we do is we measure a, a, the zip code, a, a, the zip code level, and over time, a local measure of attention to climate risk, and we check rather than checking whether houses on the beach and houses on, on you know in, in the interior are different in price on average, we check what happens when perception of climate risk in the data changes. And what do we see? We see that indeed when people become more attentive to climate risk, as reflected by these by the listings, the value of houses on the beach actually drops relative to the value of houses that are inland in the same zip code. Okay, and so this is a way. To kind of go around the identification issue uh, and uh, tries to uh, to really tease out the kind of the cause and effect of being exposure to uh, to be exposed to uh, to climate risk. It, this is you know obviously not perfect. There are some identification assumptions in the back, but it's one step forward to try to understand you know whether indeed people that are buying and selling uh, real estate in these areas were exposed to climate risk. Indeed, price incorporate this information to the price. Okay. So um, next. Uh, I, I, should, I just want to mention that this kind of study has been uh, uh, has been applied to uh, to many other asset classes, you know. And I'm not going to go into the details of this, but basically, uh, the, the, I think the bulk of the research by now there's actually quite a bit of research. They've shown that you see this pricing effect nowadays essentially across asset classes. You see it in, in, in stocks, you see in sovereigns, you see in corporate bonds, you see in municipal bonds, you see in mortgages because mortgages are also affected indirectly by climate risks. And so I think that. Overall, the, you know, what we have learned so far is that indeed markets do seem to take pricing uh, climate risk seriously and the price it in. Now, what we don't know yet, and more work is needed on this, is are the pricing this information correct? Okay, that's another whole uh, uh, game. Okay, can I ask uh, how much more time I have? I kind of lost track of time. I think you should come to an end, so another two minutes would be okay. Two minutes, okay. So I'm just going to then summarize uh, a couple more things and then I'm going to conclude. Um, so there's an other side of all this, which is what information can we learn from asset prices? Um, and uh, one of the things I, I just want to mention one piece of research I think is particularly relevant is uh, what, how can we, um, you know, for making this long-term decision in terms of policy, so in particular, you know, uh, do we want to invest in this particular technology or that particular technology? That mitigates climate change in the long run, um, you know, it's it, uh, these countries play a very important role. To give a very simple example, if I have an investment which is a hundred year benefit, but they, so three hundred thousand dollars benefit in hundred years, but they cost a thousand dollars today, you know, if you discount in these future cash flows at a at a six percent discount rate, uh, then you shouldn't invest in this project. But if you discount at three percent, you should invest in this project. And the question is, how can we learn? Where can we learn information about? These countries for such long horizons, there's been many different uh, proposals. You should, you know, use you know, purely ethical arguments. We should think about expected growth. What we argue is that we should uh, you look. The, the financial markets can give us very good information about what these countries we should be using. I'm just going to spend two minutes giving you an example from one of our papers. Okay. So in a paper with uh, Matteo Maggiore and Johanna Strobel, what we've been doing is we're looking at the housing market in the UK and Singapore. Where there's two types of ownership of house. You can house, you can own a house forever, which is called the freehold, or you can own a house only for let's say 100 years or 200 years, and that's called the lease. So when you think about the differential price you're willing to pay for a permanent ownership versus a 100 year ownership, you realize very quickly that the difference in price tells you the value you attach to the house in 100 years. So in a sense, this can reveal the the the, the discounts that people are applying to cash flow apply far in the future. That's very useful information when you think about climate policy. So we, what we find when we go and measure the, these countries in the data, so the difference, to give a headline number, the difference in a, in a house that you own forever versus one you own only for 100 years is about 15%. If you do a back of the end calculation, that means that people are applying pretty low this country. People value houses far in the future. The implied discount rate is 2.6%. Okay, 
Now, that's on a risky house. Now, when you invest in climate change mitigation, you're actually investing in investment that actually reduce your risk. One of the key lessons from finance, one of the fundamental principles, is that when you, the risk and investment that have this country, but any investment which actually is a hedge that is protecting you against the future risk should be discounted at a level lower than the risk rate. So housing, which is a risky asset, is a, this 2.6% is a discount rate that applies to, to, to risky cash flows. That's, we, we believe it's above the risk rate. So any, any uh, discount rate to be applied to climate change mitigation investment should be strictly below this 2.6%. So in other words, what we learn from finance and from these long-term uh, 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 housing markets is that 2.6% you know, is actually an upper bound on the kind of climate, uh, on the kind of these countries to be applied to mitigation uh, investments. And that would lead it, that's a pretty low number compared to being, what's been uh, typically used in climate uh, economics. And, uh, and I think we think that that's a good starting point for thinking about uh, evaluation of mitigation uh, investment. Okay, so I, I'm done. And let me just conclude. I think financial markets play an important role in the transition to a sustainable economy. Why? Because they contain very valuable input for the models and for policy evaluations. For example, this 2.6% upper bound on the, on the discount rate for climate mitigation. Uh, investments. They help ensure that funds flow to sustainable investments and they can help us manage the residual climate risk. One thing I didn't talk about, but I think it's a wonderful topic of research that is kind of very active today, is if I have to try to kind of hedge myself against the realization of climate damages, how do I build the best hedging portfolio? I've been doing some work on that, which I didn't have time to talk about. But, uh, but you know, that's an, you know, I think financial markets also play an important role in helping us, glo helping us globally uh, manage these, uh, these, these risks, okay? And I'm, gonna, I'm going to, to end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefano. Uh, that was very uh, insightful. Um, since it's already uh, pretty late here in Europe, and I think the US is waiting for lunch, so I would suggest uh, to keep it a vivid discussion uh, we allow one or two questions uh, before we then hand over uh, to Zaharias. So, uh, Stefano, if you allow me, I would just start with the first question so that the audience has uh, the possibility to uh, think of their questions. As you pointed out very clearly that the market needs information. So that if the investors has an information, it, uh, the, the awareness of um, asset prices is affected. So information leads to awareness, awareness leads to uh, pricing. Having said that, um, I mean, this is not uh, valid for, for housing, but you said that uh, you, you've looked at different asset classes. I think an important information is also a rating, right? So uh, be it an ESG rating, be it a credit rating, and the two of us have discussed this yesterday already. You know, I see now coming up a lot of ESG labels. I will not call them ratings because um, they have nothing to do with credit ratings. But this is a big business for uh, rating agencies and companies to set up uh, labels for their, uh, for their customers. And the investors looking forward to invest in sustainable uh, portfolios are keen on those labels. So they think they, this is decent information. And since we all know that uh, the discussion about greenwashing has uh, come up, um, I would like from your point of view, to know your point of view, do you think that the information we get from this ESG labeling is sufficient to raise the awareness? Um, is, do you think we need regulation? Do you think the market will do its, um, its best? Or how do you see this point? So first of all, that's a great question. Um, I, I, uh, I completely agree that, uh, you know, that we are, I think, I, I would say the following. We are, I think we are at the beginning of a process where markets are trying to figure out exactly what is the right information. Um, I, I agree with you that information is fundamental for investors. And, you know, in a sense, you know, markets are actually very good at, you know, at, at, you know, at working even when information is not complete. Uh, but, of course, the more noise there is, the worse they're going to work. And so the investment decisions are not going to be optimal because, to give a simple example, you know, if we're trying to, you know, to redirect uh, investment towards uh, green firms, if we, can't, if we cannot well identify what are, which are the green firms, then we're going to make mistakes. So 
I think that in general markets do work better if we have more high quality information. I think there's been a very big push already kind of gen, you know, uh, spurred by the demand for this kind of product. There's been a, a, a push towards a more disclosure and better disclosures. There's a lot of competition now in this space on different information providers to think about what are the key dimensions of ESG and especially of, you know, on, on green um, characteristics of firms. Uh, but, you know, I also feel like the, 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 as we are standing now, it's kind of very early. So the quality of these data is, you know, honestly pretty bad. And so I think that, the, you know, for this entire kind of, uh, for, for the financial system to, system to work well, we're going to need to figure out a way to improve the disclosures. Now, certainly we're going more standardization. You know, some of this push to standardization will come from the private sector. I think that the regulator should play a, a, a role. Not because I think ultimately the financial markets can't figure it out on their own. They probably will at some point, but to speed up the process and standardize it, I think, you know, the regulators should kind of, and they're already doing it. You know, I think it's an important role, the regulators, to actually figure out, you know, what, some way to standardize this information. I think that's going to be very, very important going forward. Thank you very much. So I see a question here from the audience. Do we have a mic? Hello. Yes, it's Paolo from Deutsche Bundesbank. Uh, thanks a lot for this interesting talk. And I would like to follow up on Mrs. Maudera's question um, because um, this, this relation between um, ESG ratings and, and transparency, you could argue that there is incentive for ESG raters to um, that there is a relationship between ESG ratings and and uh, returns, and I think Zacharias has has done some some interesting work on this. So I would like to involve him into this conversation and ask um, what, what what's your point on ESG ratings on and their role on market transparency. Thanks. Thanks. So. Um so first of all, I agree with you that uh, that there is a relation between ESG ratings and returns. That's some of the things that that you know we are all kind of following very closely and trying to understand. You know how do the you know how do these uh, ESG scores actually affect returns? And of course, you know once there is a link, there will be all sort of incentive effects. So which I also think why it's particularly important that we have some sort of standardization and there's some regulation that tells us uh, the kind of guides as the disclosures. Um, and, you know, and, and, and so, in a, in a sense, I completely agree that this needs to be transparent because if things are not transparent and markets believe that these, these scores are somewhat manipulated, then you know, the entire castle collapses and you know, prices become very little informative and the investment is, are going uh, to be wrong and mistaken. And so I think that it is, it is certainly very important. And we're in the, I think we're all in the process of figuring this out. You know, the practitioners, the regulators, the academics, they were all kind of looking at the same at, at this question closely. So I think that Zacharias also would like to come in here, right? Yeah. Thank, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I fully agree. I think we need to uh, watch out what uh, the ESG raters are doing because they're businesses and uh, so they're subject to incentives. And uh, there's quite a bit of work now showing uh, that we need to be careful when, with interpreting uh, these numbers. And I say that because I know uh, that the majority of investors, institutional investors, are heavily relying on the ratings as well as their inputs, especially also the smaller ones that don't have these big uh, ESG in-house departments. So there's some evidence, uh, like, like you mentioned, that, uh, that I'm currently working on indicating uh, that ESG ratings uh, of, of, of one, at least of one rating provider are changed ex post so as to introduce a uh, positive relationship with uh, returns, right? So we need to understand where this is coming from. Uh, you know, the hypothesis, the working hypothesis would be that if you want to sell your ESG ratings, you want to show the customer, the investor, that there is such a positive relationship, right? So you do have incentives if you revise data ex post uh, to do it in such a way that you introduce uh, such a positive link, right? And we know that these revisions are very frequent, so we need to understand to what extent they are biased or not. And second, there's also some other work, right, showing that, uh, that, that firms that are connected, sister firms that are connected with some of the ESG raters through institutional ownership uh, seem to provide uh, more favorable ratings. Right. So, you know, we're still in the process of, 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 of 
understanding the basic relations, but it's so important to do that because these ratings are so extremely important and so widely used in practice. Great, thank you very much. Um, I do not see so far another question, so therefore I would suggest, uh, Zaharias, that we continue with your presentation. And Zaharias, as I mentioned in the beginning, you have also done a lot of work on climate and uh, the impact on the financial markets. And uh, today we do have the honor to listen to you, to your results of a really remarkable uh, survey. Uh, you did a survey with uh, your co-authors co and you got, I think, what is remarkable, uh, four, nearly 440 responses um, from, from uh, institutional investors. And your survey aimed at, first of all, to understand how institutional investors consider climate risk in their investment decisions. And secondly, and that is what you already started uh, to explain, you want to know how, to, how the value climate-related um, uh, disclosure, so especially, you know, what do they think about the actual uh, disclosure regime? So the floor is yours, Sarias. Thank you very much. Also from my side, a big thank you to the organizers uh, for putting uh, together such a wonderful conference. I've already learned a lot. And uh, let me give you the good news first. Uh, it's going to be the least technical presentation uh, of all of them today. I think I'll basically just show you summary statistics from our survey. I should also say that what I'm presenting is going to be totally biased. It's totally biased in two ways. First, uh, because it's my own work, uh, of course like I was asked to present here. And second, um, more importantly, it's very much biased by the fact that I have uh, three young daughters at home with four years, two years, and two months. So I deeply care about the future and uh, that we're getting uh, the climate uh, crisis uh, addressed as soon as possible. So um, the key message, uh, I'll, uh, I'll preview my presentation uh, is going to be uh, based on this uh, survey that we were running among institutional investors. And I'll show you later, we had a lot of very, very big investors and a lot of top management respondents from these investors in the survey. So uh, it's really important people that tell us something here about climate risks. So essentially, there are four uh, key takeaways that I'll present you. First, institutional investors, according to our survey, are deeply concerned about climate risks they have very dire temperature change expectations. They believe cr uh, climate risks have started materializing, but are underpriced, not correctly priced in equity markets yet. Second, and that's the bad news, so to speak, they have only started to address climate risks, and that in very basic ways. And then, uh, as just mentioned, uh, the second uh, key takeaways are going to be about climate disclosure. And let me just very briefly motivate why this is so important to consider. There has been a survey recently by Johannes Ströbel and uh, Jeff Workler from NYU among academics and investors asking them about what they think are the most important financial tools to reduce firms' carbon footprints. The number one is the carbon tax, unexpectedly expectedly, and second, somewhat unexpectedly, climate-related disclosures. So therefore, the next two results uh, that we'll present you about are about climate-related disclosures. So third result is that uh, institutional investors think that climate-related disclosures are critically important, but that the current disclosure practice is lacking. There's a lack of quantitative and qualitative information. And then some good news. Uh, we have evidence now beyond the survey, as I'll explain, that institutional investors actively engage firms and are successful in improving climate-related disclosures by their portfolio firms, and also that they invest in firms with better disclosures. So just to set the stage very briefly, uh, very briefly uh, let me uh, make a, a few remarks about uh, climate change and the role for institutional investors. Now, in finance, as Stefano was saying, we know how to deal with risks. We teach our students how to measure, how to uh, quantify, how to hedge risks. We know how to do that with interest rate risks, with credit risks, and so on. Now, the problem is we basically don't know yet how to do that with climate risks. Climate risks are very difficult to price and hedge. They're systematic. There's poor disclosure. We don't know where the risks are sitting. There's a lack of instruments. 
uh, in order to hatch them. On top of that, climate risks are highly uncertain, the climate path is uncertain, and as we've just heard today, it's also highly uncertain how the regulatory response will look like. On top of that, uh, these risks are very difficult to diversify because they're highly correlated, especially transition risks. It's likely that uh, a lot of countries at the same time will start with a, with a strong uh, regulatory response rather than that being somewhat randomly distributed across countries. Now, what I want you also to note is that it's critical that institutional investors are involved in the net zero transition. They're the, major the majority shareholders in most companies. I think 70% of uh, equities in the US is held by institutional investors. Many institutional investors are act actually very engaged in trying to uh, address uh, so different initiatives, the, the, the climate crisis, think of Climate Action 100 plus and other coalitions. Importantly also, like it was mentioned uh, in the introduction, the, 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 the Paris Agreement requires huge capital reallocations from brown to green sectors, and that's the job of institutional investors and banks to do these reallocations. I also want to mention here uh, that we also need the brown sectors to keep uh, getting funding uh, because someone needs to finance uh, the technology that makes the chimneys greener. Right? So it's not a solution to just pull everything out of the brown sectors and move it into the green sectors. So the first question I'll try to answer is what are institutional investors' views and actions on climate risks? As I mentioned, uh, it's based on a survey of a broad base of institutional investors. It's based on this paper with Philip Krüger and Laura Starks. And um, we have uh, a global respondent group. A third of the respondents have executive level positions and we have 48 responses from institutions with more than 100 billion in assets under management. So the first question uh, we ask uh, the investors, and now you know, think it through your own, uh, own mind quickly, was what are your temperature expectations by the end of the century? Right? We were giving as a framework, uh, as a framing, the Paris degree target of 1.5 to 2 degrees. So we asked these investors, what are you expecting? Now that's what they are saying. So horizontally, the different degrees, uh, temperature changes uh, by the end of the century, and then you know, we have also split that by origin of the investors here uh, with the different colors. Now what you see is four in 10 expect a rise that exceeds the Paris target. So we've just heard today what that means. It means that four in 10 investors have extremely disastrous climate expectations. So keep that in mind if you later see what they're doing in order to answer the question for yourself whether their actions are consistent with their expectations. Before I show you this, I also want to mention that according to our survey, if we ask them, when do you expect these risks to materialize, the majority says already today these risks are materializing, especially regulatory risks. So uh, before I show you what they do in order to address the risk, let me briefly mention what they say in response to the question of why they incorporate climate risks in the investment process. Now you would, you would expect it's primarily because of risk or return considerations. Well, that's not exactly what we find. Our survey says it's mostly to protect the reputation. I don't want to say cover your ass, it's a maybe a little bit too, too negative, but it's to protect your reputation. Then we also have some moral ethical uh, considerations and only lower down here in the ranking we see the return, the risk considerations. So let's look at climate risk management. What are these investors actually doing? So if you look at uh, their responses, uh, I think uh, I'll need back the slides here uh, on my screen uh, if that is possible. Uh, otherwise I'll, thank you. Uh, otherwise, I'll do it without the slides. Uh, so what you see here is uh, the responses uh, to the question of what, what they're doing. And I think a key takeaway, if you're eyeballing uh, the responses, is that they're doing pretty little. So despite the dire temperature expectations, only 38% are doing the most basic things, which is analyzing the carbon footprint of the portfolio firms. And let me mention also here that, of course, we have a selected sample investors responding to a climate survey are probably the investors that care more about the topic than the others. So if you would incorporate you know, the full population, the numbers would probably look even worse. 
You can also see positively uh, that there is some action, that they are doing some things. Uh, but again, uh, it's still very basic. Analyzing the carbon footprint is something very basic. It's not really climate risk management. What you also see here is that engagement is generally preferred over divestment. Only 20% say that their preferred uh, climate risk management is divestment. So the other general staying engaged uh, and doing something seems to be more frequent. We also asked them, uh, as good as it's possible in a survey, about whether uh, they think that climate-related risks and opportunities are correctly priced across different sectors, because it's likely to vary across sectors. To interpret the results on the next slide, keep in mind that if an investor here gave the answer that valuations in a certain sector are too high, uh, we code it as a plus two. If it said it's too low, uh, we code it with a minus, minus two. So what do we find? First of all, you see that on average, uh, across the sectors, the response is positive. So there is a perception that overall, across all sectors, climate risks are not correctly priced, so valuations are too high. Where is it particularly strong, the misvaluation, the, over, the underpricing of the risk in oil, automotive, electric utilities, information technology, which requires a lot of energy, and insurance. We also asked them where they see investment opportunities. I guess uh, the good news is that they do see uh, opportunities, in particular here in renewable energy and, and, and water and energy storage related things. The second question, as I mentioned, uh, was about understanding the preferences of institutional investors with respect to climate related disclosures. The responses are in part, uh, or the results are in part based also on this survey, uh, which, which is together again uh, here in this paper with uh, Philip, uh, with Laura, but also with my PhD student uh, from Frankfurt, Imihan Ilhan. And we complement the survey responses with investor holdings and climate related disclosure data from CDP uh, in order to get also some archival observational evidence. The first result uh, is very simple but striking. So we asked, how important do you think, uh, how important do you consider climate reporting compared to standard financial reporting? And what you see is that 51% of the investors say it's equally important and quite a few actually think it's even more important. Uh, again, there's a bias because of the selection of respondents. Of course, we also know financial reporting is already quite mature, but still it suggests that there is a big demand by institutional investors uh, for, for climate-related information so that they can price the risk properly. What we also ask them is, you know, how do they assess the current disclosure practice? Uh, a lot of the respondents believe that uh, current management discussions are insufficiently precise, that there is a lack of quantitative information that is comparable across firms on climate-related uh, uh, disclosures, that more standardization, mandatory reporting is needed, and in general, that disclosure tools are lacking. There's also um, the response that investors should demand that portfolio firms disclose their risks. So the view that institutional investors should actively engage firms to improve such disclosures. And the evidence I'll show you on the next slide is consistent, at least in part, with uh, that response. So what we did was uh, we were moving away from uh, the, the, the survey, and that's, that's the last, set, uh, last slide with, with results here, uh, moved away from the survey and uh, collected global data on disclosure of climate risks in the CDP survey. So the CDP, uh, as you may know, is, is a global organization backed by institutional investors that send surveys uh, to companies to require information on uh, their climate-related uh, risks. And what we are testing is whether there is a relationship between institutional ownership in a company and disclosure to the CDP. And what we find as a baseline result is that in firms where you have more so-called climate-conscious institutional investors, there's better disclosure. What are climate conscious investors? These are investors that come from countries where you have high social and environmental norms. Um, these are uh, investors that are subject to stewardship codes in their home countries that promote environmental uh, issues uh, and that are more universal investors that are caring about externalities originating from climate change across the portfolio. So we find that there's this positive relationship. Uh, between in climate conscious institutional ownership and, and disclosure. And then we're dipping, digging deeper because if you see this correlation, right, it could come from an influence effect. Uh, 
that institutional investors are actively engaging firms, the climate conscious ones, institutional investors, to improve the disclosure. But it could also originate from a selection effect whereby institutional investors that are climate conscious invest more in firms that provide better disclosures. And basically, using you know, different, different settings, uh, we find evidence for both. Uh, what are the settings we use? The details are in the paper. Uh, we explored this, this path-breaking and pioneering, I think, uh, Article 173 in France that requires that also institutional investors in France disclose on climate risks. So they have a stronger demand once this Article 173 has been introduced. Uh, for climate information by their portfolio firms. So we find that this article actually helps that in firms uh, with lots of French investor in disclosure improves. Uh, second, to also establish a causal effect of institutional owners on disclosure, we look at this Investor Coalition Climate Action 100 Plus, which targets the biggest carbon emitters in the world. And we also find that this uh, initiative seems to be having uh, positive disclosure effects, uh, especially when it comes to disclosure verification. And to document the selection effect, we look at the UK's uh, reform to introduce mandatory carbon disclosure and find that in firms that prior to the reform did not disclose carbon uh, emissions but are now forced to do so because of the reform, there's an increase in institutional ownership. So they seem to prefer this information. Let me conclude with something very simple. I'm convinced climate change will have a major impact on all of us because all of us probably have some money invested by institutional investors. And crucially, I also think that institutional investors can, and I hope will, have a major impact on climate change through their engagement activities. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zaharius. Uh, I think this was already quite a lot. <laughs> Let me uh, start uh, with the first question. Um, I think you pointed out very clearly um, that, especially institutional investors that responded, do have at least some kind of awareness of, about climate risk. Nevertheless, and I think this is uh, astonishing, uh, climate or any uh, ecological risk is only ranked fifth or sixth. Why? So, so, so that's absolutely right. So uh, what we also did in the survey was uh, we presented them with different investment risks, financial risks, governance risks, etc., cetera, uh, and uh, climate risk and asked them uh, to, to, to kind of rank the relative importance of these risks and, and indeed find uh, that climate risks are ranked relatively low. I think that does reflect uh, that traditionally in most uh, institutional investor uh, uh, houses, uh, there is a very strong focus on governance, financial risks. If you just count the people that are doing financial due diligence and compare it to the number of people that are uh, looking at, at climate risks, I think it's shocking, right? And it's shocking because we've just heard today how important that, that risk is. Uh, and uh, I think these responses reflect uh, this underappreciation of the importance uh, of the risk. Again, we're gradually uh, seeing changes. Some investors, I should also say that, are already quite ahead of the curve, uh, but the vast majority still needs to do a lot of uh, homework uh, given the, the importance of, uh, of these risks. Thank you, Therese. And I see two more questions here in Milan. So may I ask you to start? Sure. My name is Tom Heller from Stanford University and uh, Willis Towers Watson. I wanted to pick up on a number of uh, things that were said, both by Zacharias and, and, and Stefano, about where we're going. And it, that is actually observing empirical behavior in the markets, as, as, as Zacharias has, has described. And uh, just put out a series of things that, are, that seem to be happening that are very relevant to what uh, is, is being discussed and where this agenda might go. Uh, we do have a new book coming out on Net Zero, uh, which will presumably be out next month. Uh, the interesting thing about the ESG, even including ESG rather than just climate, um, as the risk to be discussed, is that um, the incentives are, as Zacharias said, distorted. As you add value to information, then it's going to go behind paywalls. And we see that happening everywhere. And then it's very hard to compare across without some sort of regulation. But when you start taking into account the nature of what is being disclosed with scope three, 
No one really knows exactly what that means. Um, it, an emission is exactly the same as far as being reported, whether it happens in Sweden under a carbon price or whether it happens in Vietnam. There is no weighting of emissions for what we're really after, which is whether they're priced or not. Um, and, and, and finally, the, the transition plans are just laden with offsets uh, that, that whose value at this point is extremely uncertain. So the ESG has a lot of problems built into it still at the conceptual level. Um, I do want to point out the, a point that Stefano made that was really important, which is if you do believe you have climate risk and you don't know whether it's priced into the assets, using a strategy where you buy some products that are either include carbon-friendly firms or divest, exclude non-carbon uh, or, or carbon-intensive firms is not a rational strategy. Stefano said you need the hedge, and that's exactly right. There are new hedging products out in the market that are not seeking alpha, they're beta products. Uh, they're looking at indexes, revaluing the whole market. Uh, which is what you need to do to hedge. And then the last thing I'll say, because I know time is very limited, is what we see is a huge movement of climate risk uh, away from the private sector where it's being examined through disclosure to SOEs in various forms of, 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 of public entities, uh, to private equity to a very substantial degree, to new exotic forms of credit um, and, and shadow banking. And the result of all of this is that the risk is moving to places which are outside the regulatory system. And most importantly, it's being transferred to sovereigns, which brings us to the basic question, um, whether that is done through the taxes they take, the ownership they have, the bailouts they do, the social insurance or inefficient insurance like flood insurance or fire insurance in, Cali in California. So the central banks who are the managers of the sovereign balance sheets have to, in that sense, become more active in this area because that's where the risk is migrating. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is, uh, you know, some statements we could talk hours and hours about. So I would like uh, to gather uh, the questions before I hand over to Zaharias and Stefano. So who's next, please? Can you please uh, keep it short? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, uh, Emanuele Campiglio, University of Bologna and RFF CMCC, European Institute. Thank you for the fascinating talks and it was also very interesting to see them back to back because there is a quite strong overlap in terms of research questions, looking at the perceptions of investors to uh, climate-related risks, uh, but using different methods. So Stefano and co-authors use actual data, Zacharias and co-authors ask investors what they think. So I was um, uh, wondering if both the speakers could comment on what they think are the strengths and weaknesses of each methodology. Thank, Thank you. Uh, hi, th th thanks for this uh, wonderful survey. I have a question on central banking, since this is a central banking conference. Um, so we know that central banks are quite good at setting expectations and directing the market. So if a central bank tells the market that interest rates are likely to stay low, uh, low for a long period of time, the market follows and buys bonds, especially if the central bank is credible. Um, so considering that your survey shows such a big disconnect between what uh, investors perceive as the great climate change risk and what they actually do, um, what can central banks do now in order to bridge that gap? Um, so, for example, as far as I know, Bank of England is the first central bank that has the net zero transition as a part of its mandate, right? And from what I can tell, they're a bit confused as to how to actually execute on that new part of their mandate. At least that's what I get, gather from a few of their public statements. So, from your perspective, what should, for example, Bank of England be doing right now in terms of directing the market in the, towards bridging that gap that you're exposing through a survey. Thank you. Is there another question in the room? Yes, hello. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, Panagiotis Andreou, Cyprus University of Technology. I have a question uh, on the following. So we have institutional investors who admit that um, climate change and climate risk reporting and disclosure is poor. So this means that uh, their trades and actions 
uh, are based on purely reported and poor quality reports and data. So the question is, uh, how can we learn from the markets if the people and the sophisticated investors who trade the, into the markets, they don't make trades based on accurate information that re reflects all these uh, climate risks? Thank you. So, um, in the interest of uh, time, I would give the floor uh, to the uh, speakers. I see there uh, one question from also the WebEx from Decentis, who um, uh, is talk uh, asking whether um, it would be a good idea to set a tax uh, for the negative externalities in both companies and consumers and so on. So maybe you can also include in your answers this question. Um, from from the Webex. Okay, so, yeah, okay. So, and there's one uh, question left here yeah. in the room. I, I have uh, also a very quick question. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, regarding the perception and, uh, I mean, uh, the market complete information completeness. We, we, we have uh, understood from uh, the presentation that uh, there is uh, um, uh, in, 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 an expectation of uh, investors regarding policy decision, but the policy uncertainty is, uh, is there out there. Uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, to Zacharias how uh, the market can uh, integrate policy uncertainty, and as well um, to um, um, uh, Stefano, uh, how the uh, incompleteness of uh, uh, climate information can be uh, considered as the, the, the market prices, as you uh, very well uh, measure uh, the differential between green and brown assets, reflect only the information that investors ha um, have or perceive, while the actual uh, uh, climate risk exposure and risks can be different. So how can we move forward from what is the perception, what is uh, the actual risk exposure? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very well lit question. So I would like uh, to give uh, Stefano first the floor. Stefano, could you um, answer to most of the question in uh, a two minutes time? That would be lovely. I will be, I will be flesh garden. So first of all, I think that uh, uh, there's, so let me just start with, with the last question because I think actually there's a theme that came up uh, many times in the last in, in several questions, which is how well we will markets work if we believe there's so much um, uh, there's so much noise uh, you know and we don't just have very much information. I think that the, I mean obviously prices will be not as informative uh, about uh, the true exposures, and I think you know. It, it, there there are two things to say. One is that you know the markets have been kind of historically very good at dealing with incomplete information. I mean, right now, you know, think about what do we know publicly on a company. There are some things we know, and there's a lot of things we don't know, and markets being very good at, you know, for example, using satellite data to really think about the, you know, the supply chain of a company. And, you know, markets have been pretty good at working with incomplete information. So, you know, is there a disconnect between the risk exposure and what we can measure? Yes. And that's why I think that uh, it's important that we move to a world where regulators put some standard and there's more transparency. And, uh, you know, and, and it's not like markets will don't work without this, this extra information, but I think the more information that, that there will be, the better it is. I think, you know, given that time is kind of uh, critical in this entire process, I think we do want to uh, move uh, speedily towards uh, releasing better information. Then I have, I, I, just, I just wanted to make two extra comments in response to the many interesting questions that came up. One is that, what's the difference between prices and surveys? Uh, I think that, you know, they're, they're very different. I mean, obviously, they both depends on the perception of investors. I think that prices are obviously very well measured, but they are also full of confounders because, you know, risk attitudes also matter and, you know, the composition of investors matters. And so they, I, I, to me, the main trade-off is prices are very well measured, but, you know, they reflect a bunch of different things that we need to do extra work to tease out what's incorporated into prices, whereas surveys... Uh, on which I also work, by the way, on like on the modern retail side, I think they, they don't have this issue because they clearly go directly to what's interesting and what we care about, which is how people perceive uh, risk exposures, but they're noise. Okay, we know that, you know, it's not a, it's measure, you know, there's measurement error in surveys that you don't have in prices. And then the third thing that I want to go back was go back to the first question, 
uh, which was about the hedge. And you know, I've been talking a lot with people in the industry about this. And I think this movement toward green investment has been kind of mostly historically mostly prompted by, in a sense, what you can call sentiment, which is you know, for ethical reasons, investors really wanted to to invest in green in, in green investments and. You know, and the industry kind of originally started to say, yeah, if you do these investments, you actually can get great returns. They used to be kind of more of an alpha view. I think this alpha view is, is not sustainable in the long run because I believe that to the extent that people do have a uh, preference for green investments, prices will go up and, this, and, and you know, expected returns will go down. The equilibrium for green investments is going to be lower than, 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 than polluting investments. And I think the right way to think about it is not in terms of alpha, but indeed it is in terms of beta is when you buy a green product, what you're doing, you're buying insurance. And you're buying insurance against potential future climate risk. And if you understand it this way, you understand you're buying a negative beta product, you shouldn't go and expect high returns. You should expect low returns, just like when you buy an insurance product. And so I think that's going to be an important switch in mentality from the point of view of investors going forward. And we already see that some investors already uh, already understand this. Thank and you. I, go, I, want leave, I don't want to take too much time. So thank, thank you very much. So, Zaharias. Yeah, great. Great questions. Uh, let me first respond to the last question, which is still close to my research, and then I'll become more speculative and provocative uh, with respect to the other questions. So on the uh, policy uncertainty, um, so I've done some work uh, where we show uh, that uh, regulatory uncertainty is priced. Uh, so if firms have larger carbon emissions invest and therefore are more subject uh, to, to, to future regulation, then you find that for such firms uh, in the option markets, investors are willing to pay a price for insurance products out of the money options, especially deep out of the money options to insure themselves uh, against uh, regulatory risks. And I think that's important. We find uh, that uh, this price of insurance against regulatory risks uh, moves over time with uh, attention to climate change. Uh, and that's important because if now the central banks or others all of a sudden uh, hopefully uh, put a lot of focus on addressing that firmly, uh, it may have very uh, sharp uh, effects uh, in asset price in asset markets. So then uh, on, on the other on the other points um, now the net zero commitments that we all read about uh, to a large extent when I read them I have to laugh. Uh, if I read what the airline industry dared to put out recently about its net zero commitments, it's a joke, right? I mean, it's like flying an airplane and while you fly, you have to invent the landing gear because they're requiring inventions to reduce the footprints that are not there yet, right? It's a joke, right? And we have to get up and say, this is a joke. And I think we also have to get to the point, if we take seriously what the investors are saying here, that it's not going to work out, that the Paris target is not going to work out. We have to take the hothouse scenario as the base scenario. Right? That's what the, res the respondents in our survey are thinking. Right? And that means potential disastrous uh, effects uh, in, in asset markets. Again, that's the more speculative part, happy to to confess that. Now, the question about what the central banks are, uh, can do, right? you know, of course, uh, together with other initiatives, require disclosure, make sure you can only uh, uh, c uh, use as collateral at the ECB bonds that, require, uh, that, that satisfy disclosure requirements. Go a step further, you know, this is such a big risk, there need to be capital requirements uh, for, uh, for firms with high uh, climate risks go a step further and adjust the purchases uh, at the central banks, right? Not for ethical reasons, it's a risk consideration, right? So the toolkits are out there, we just have to implement them. And today, not tomorrow, we have to implement them today. So thank you very much. And that was, you know, really an interesting uh, setting. Maybe I take one of the questions that was, uh, I think, not uh, quite covered was the question about the central banks and how they, you know, uh, what is their way of um, adjusting their portfolio. First of all, I think it's very important to understand that central banks do not do proactive climate policy. That's not their task. That's the task of an uh, elected government. But, and this is uh, important to, to understand, what we do, and I think Sarah has pointed it out, we do have to protect our own portfolio. So it's in our own interest. 
Now, if the, the, the question is, how do you protect your own balance sheets? Well, we have, and especially in the Euro system, done a lot um, to, to protect it. It includes um, uh, disclosure, uh, risk analysis, and a lot of things. But one point that is very important to understand, and that is not um, well understood so far, Asset purchase programs mostly consist out of sovereigns, not of corporate bonds. So the greener the sovereign or the fiscal budget gets, the greener the balance sheets of the central banks. So we are dependent on the, to, that the governments green their fiscal budgets. If they don't do, you know, a portfolio, a central bank portfolio of 95% of sovereigns will only get greener if their governments get greener, right? So this is, uh, this is our issue. <laughs> but still you can uh, be uh, assured that central banks take their responsibility. And now I come to the end and say, I think they have already taken responsibility and setting up such a conference. It was really great. Uh, thank you once again, Banca d'Italia and Bank of England. And maybe if you do me a favor, just listen to me once again. I really would encourage all of you, all of the researchers to keep on studying about the risk and the impact of climate change on the financial sector, because for us practitioners, it is just crucial to understand and to get your um, evidence. So thank you very much. Thank you.